first responders share how to stay safe in the summer heat. Don't think that you're above it. Don't think it's not going to happen to you. Plus, what policymakers can do to protect communities from climate change. And it should be taken seriously um, by our municipalities. And developer Randy Dorman on her breakout into local politics as a candidate for Tucson mayor. I've helped lead the way in downtown revitalization for 20 years. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivetta. Thank you for joining us. The first full week of summer delivered triple digit highs in Tucson. With it comes some familiar reminders about staying cool and hydrated. That may go without saying for many Southern Arizonans, but it's a message worth repeating for first responders who handle dozens of heat related calls this time of year. We learn more about what they often encounter. Last year, Tucson Fire responded to nearly 200 calls related to heat exposure, with the busiest months between June and August. Since joining Tucson Fire more than a decade ago, paramedic Pete Weinman has experienced plenty of summers with the department, and he's quick to spot the signs when someone is experiencing heat illness. It can be anything from just, you know, sweating, not feeling well, cramps, um, all the way up to hallucinations, unconsciousness, heavy breathing, um, seizures, there's, there's a lot of different ways that it manifests, just depending on how bad it is, the severity of it. How common is that occurrence for you guys here at this station? Uh, it happens, it, it really does, more, probably more than you'd think. Um, for the homeless population, we do have quite a few homeless uh, people around here. They're, you know, they don't have the option a lot of times to be inside, unfortunately. Um, but also the elderly population, they're affected quite heavily by it. And the younger, you know, kids outside playing around, they don't realize how hot they're getting and all of a sudden they don't feel right. Weinman says other groups at risk include people who work outdoors, including construction workers and even first responders like himself. Firefighters fighting fires, um, if we get one of those, we have to be uh, ready to switch out crews a lot quicker than we might normally because we're getting hot. I know you've been doing this for a few years now. There's probably a message that you have for people because this happens to visitors, but also longtime Arizonans who say, I can handle it or it's not that hot. You know, we, we tell people, we go on calls, we say pretty much everybody in Arizona is a little bit dehydrated just to begin with, just because there's no humidity in the air. You're, you're breathing it out, you're sweating it out. And even if you're not, your skin isn't wet, you know, you, you, you're still losing moisture. So. Don't think that you're above it. Don't think it's not going to happen to you. You're going to get dehydrated, especially if you're spending time outside, especially if you know, you're know you already sick, something like that. Make sure that you are prepared, drinking lots of fluids. And you've seen it before where it's too late or it's going to take time to recover from that dehydration. Oh yeah, for sure. We, we see people, we have to take people to the hospital that, like I said, their, their body temperatures could be 107 degrees. If your body temperature is really high, uh, heat stroke type symptoms, you're going to stop sweating, you're going to start kind of shaking, you're going to have hallucinations, you could have seizures. Uh, you know, at that point, you might not be able to call for yourself, so you better hope somebody's around that can call for you. If you do encounter someone experiencing severe heat exhaustion, Tucson Fire says call 911, get the person in a shaded area or a space with AC, and keep them off of hot surfaces like black asphalt. Avoid giving them ice water since it could lead to cramping. Weinman has these other tips. If they're wearing heavy clothing, get that off of them. Loose fitting clothing is the best uh, when you're really hot. If, if they're really hot, I mean, Take the clothes off them as much as you can because that really traps body heat. Uh, if you have water or anything like that, you can wet their clothing down and that actually helps through, through evaporation a lot. If you do have somebody that is unconscious, don't put anything in their mouth. Don't try to put cool water in their mouth. Don't try to put anything ice in their mouth. They can choke on that. It can become a choking hazard and then they're in a worse spot than usual. With heat blanketing all of southern Arizona, beyond city limits, the Pima County Sheriff's Department search and rescue team has the surrounding mountain ranges and trails covered. We are one of the busiest uh, search and rescue units in the state of Arizona. Steve Faria, sergeant and supervisor for search and rescue, says his team responds to more than 200 calls a year. On this day, most of his seven-man crew is conducting training with SWAT at the Pima Regional Training Center. While the majority of their calls concern injured or lost hikers, it's not limited to that group alone. During hunting season, uh, we'll get uh, hunters, uh, maybe they get lost um, or you know, injured somewhere. 
Uh, we get bird watchers, um, other people that just may not intend to go out for a very long hike, uh, just you know, a brief one mile hike or so could get disoriented on the trail. Uh, they could succumb to the heat. Faree says anyone caught in a situation where they are lost or injured should call for help. He offers these tips to prevent a worst case scenario. If you are going to hike, I would recommend in the morning, uh, just be cognizant of your water level. Um, you know, once you start getting to that halfway uh, of your water, you need to seriously consider turning around. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't consider is cell phone service out in the wilderness. Um, if your phone is constantly searching, your battery is going to drain very quickly. Um, I'd recommend either taking a battery uh, charger with you with your cell phone um, or put your phone on airplane mode. Uh, you're still able to use uh, mapping apps uh, through satellites on airplane mode. So a good app on your phone so that way you kind of can get a general idea of where you're at and then you can provide us information as well if you do uh, become in a situation where you need help. I know strength in numbers is important or telling somebody where you plan to be, but you can also become disoriented if something happens to you on your hike. It's very easy to become disoriented. You may think that you're going back the direction that you came, um, and that's not always the case. Um, one thing that we will generally tell people is once they get in that situation where they realize they need help, just stop, stay where you're at, uh, because it's very hard to look for a moving person. Uh, it's gonna hamper our search efforts, so if we can get that person to be stationary, uh, we deploy the resources uh, into the field, it's much easier to look for a stationary person. Because we understand the urgency of, uh, of our response, uh, we certainly put that person first. Uh, so we're moving quick, but uh, you know, that's just part of the job that everybody in the unit understands. Triple digit highs don't deter everyone from heading outdoors. It came with heavy consequences three years ago on Father's Day when the high hit 115 degrees. Four people died, including three hikers in the Catalina Mountains and a woman walking on the loop on Tucson's south side. Back then, Michelle Mano served as a consultant for the Pima County Health Department. She advised the county on ways to protect the public from rising temperatures. With Arizona 360, Mano's discussed what steps people and local government can take to stay safe. How is it that it's avoidable given that you live in the desert? There's also an economic component here. Some people can't afford air conditioning or to buy things like Gatorade or electrolytes that they're constantly uh, drinking throughout the day. So how do you manage it when maybe you can't really afford to? Well, interestingly, when we looked at several years of uh, emergency department presentations for heat illness, we found that most of them were due to outdoor exposure rather than indoor exposure. It was a very small fraction of, of people who um, did not have sufficient cooling in their homes. That's not to minimize that. Of course, that's an issue we should always be thinking about. But uh, much of the severe illness and, and death were people who uh, either chose to be outdoors for recreational activities, doing errands, working on their homes in the middle of the day, or outdoor workers. What can the city local government do to try and support people who spend their time outdoors? Well, one thing we have not yet touched on, but I believe some corporations in Phoenix have, is to have some restrictions during extreme heat, to limit the work hours, to call off work when certain temperatures are reached. And these kinds of regulations are in effect in other hot and dry parts of the world, um, in, including the Middle East, in Australia. And I think that's something that, that we need to look at. How is it that we can adapt? Are there simple ways that we can think about differently in our day to day? <laughs> well, the first step of adaptation, or as many of us like to call it, climate resilience, is first of all to recognize it and to accept it as something that needs to be a priority. And then the next thing is educating. We want to keep the message out there. It's really hot. It's really hot. Be careful. Carry water. Don't leave anyone in the car. All of those reminders. It's not a day to hike. And so getting the education out there and then having people listen, right? That's how we learn our lessons. You know, despite the fact that this could be avoided, understanding why illness still happens, why do people still go out and hike when it's 112, for example, 
um, and then looping back and finding out how we can do that education better. So I, I think that's a big part of it. And it's not rocket science. Those are not difficult things to do. It just takes focus and political will at the community level. There are certainly people who live in the desert and who say this is just part of our day to day and it's how we manage, but it should be taken seriously. It should be taken seriously, definitely. And it should be taken seriously um, by our municipalities, right? So heat emergencies uh, affect, uh, will affect different people different ways. Certainly those who don't have a home to go to or anywhere to go during the day, they rely on places like the public library. Um, we don't have sufficient cooling areas, for example, for those experiencing homelessness. So that, that's an area that we need to focus on. Um, and we need to develop resources for people who suddenly find themselves in a home that doesn't have cooling, for example. So um, there are many things that, that we can do um, in those extreme heat emergencies, but that's not my biggest fear. My biggest fear is the big emergency. And the big emergency will be, at some point, an extended power outage during extreme heat. Is there a plan in place should that occur? <clears throat> Unfortunately, there are not comprehensive plans in place uh, at any level. That is something we need to work on. Um, I think that that would need to begin at the state level, but also locally we can start putting some things into place to prepare for such a thing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Michelle, thank you. Yeah. Excess heat can also affect the air we breathe, impacting the risk for wildfires and urban ozone levels. The conditions can be hazardous to our health. For more about the connection between air quality and public health, we turn to Eric Betterton, a U of A professor who's chairman of the Pima County Environmental Quality Advisory Council. Let's begin with the urban ozone. Is Tucson, Pima County in a dangerous position? We are um, because last year, 2018, we exceeded the ozone standard for the first time in our history. So that should put us on alert. The reason we did is partly because the standards have been uh, tightened and also partly because it's getting more and more difficult for us to control the ozone concentration. So the two sort of conflicted and now we're in jeopardy of exceeding it. Was heat a factor then? I don't know for sure, but I do know that um, heat does increase ozone concentrations. Does heat impact our air quality? It does in that sense. The ozone concentration um, goes up. Um, um, also, other pollutants like NOx, that brown gas that you sometimes see in, in the air, uh, that goes up with more emissions from vehicles as well. People are driving more, they're using the AC more, so the pollutant concentrations tend to go up. Can things like wildfire smoke impact our air quality? They certainly do, uh, because the smoke is just um, air particles, little particles suspended in the air, and uh, they are regulated uh, by the EPA all particles are regulated by the EPA, whether it be dust or smoke or any other source. So yes, it does. And uh, when you inhale those particles, especially the very fine particles, they get deep into your lungs and then you have difficulty breathing. And what you referenced to at the very beginning of the interview, is Tucson more susceptible than other communities because of the heat? Um, the heat will uh, result in higher ozone concentrations, but that's not the only ingredient. Uh, there's sunlight, there's gasoline vapor, VOCs, and there's this brown gas, NO2. So you need all three of those. And um, as I mentioned, we can't regulate our sunlight, but we can try to control the VOCs and the NOx, and in that way keep the ozone concentration down. How likely is it that we could get dangerously close again this year? We're bumping up there. I did check the data before coming here. We're about halfway through the season. We haven't violated yet. The, the standard is 70 part per billion. Um, we've seen 69 part per billion so far. So just a tad below the standard. When you say 70 parts per billion? That's right. Can you put that in layman's terms for me? It would be like a drop in a swimming pool. Very, very small concentrations, but uh, ozone has a very strong effect on one's lungs. 
What happens if this community surpasses that mark yet again? Well, uh, the EPA uh, will eventually come down on us and ask us to implement what's called a state implement implementation plan, mm -hmm. a SIP. We have to put forward a plan to the EPA to show them how we're going to come back in compliance. And that plan will probably include tighter controls on those two ingredients, the VOCs and the NOx. Oddly enough, here in Tucson, it may be that during the monsoon, when the plants get the rain, they may become a dominant source of the VOCs, which we cannot control, of course. But during the winter, when the plants become dormant, it may be automobiles are the dominant source of VOCs, and nobody knows at, for, at present. I'm not a scientist, but this sounds serious, is it? Well, it's serious in that uh, the EPA has a big stick. I don't know that they'd ever wield it, but they could withhold federal highway dollars from Arizona and from Pima County. Tucson seems a bit more progressive when it comes to, to undertaking a shift. Would you agree? Um, I think people of Tucson understand uh, the value of clean air, good air quality. Um, others may not, but I think we do, because it really does affect children and the elderly the most. And of course, we, we're quite a young um, city here, a lot of youngsters. We also happen to be a destination for right, retirees, so both ends of the age spectrum are represented here, and both of them are most affected by pollutants such as ozone. Okay, Eric, thank you. You're welcome. This week, President Trump announced his latest pick for press secretary. Stephanie Grisham's journey to the West Wing traces back to Arizona. Grisham was spokeswoman for the Arizona House Republicans when she joined the Trump presidential campaign, eventually working her way up to communications director for the First Lady. For insight into what she may bring to this new role, we turn to Barrett Marson, a Republican political consultant who crossed paths with Grisham frequently in Phoenix. He joined us via Skype. You've known Stephanie Grisham for a number of years. What would you say is her style? What type of press secretary will she be? Yeah, you know, I think she is going to be absolutely tenacious. It's how she was here in Arizona. She's a fierce advocate and defender of the people she worked for, uh, Attorney, Ter Attorney General Tom Horn and House Speaker David Gowan. So she was a fierce defender of them, and they each had fairly minor uh, ethical issues that they had to deal with while in office. So Stephanie is well accustomed to uh, things going wrong in a, in a particular uh, uh, job there, uh, you know, having to deal with PR crises uh, uh, several at a time. She's very familiar with that. Obviously, this is a much bigger scale. You and I both know that there's been quite a bit of turnover in the Trump administration. How do you see Stephanie managing what could be coming her way by way of just keeping tabs of this crisis, as you put it? Yeah, you know, managing the personnel will be, you know, something a little different for Stephanie. I mean, she was a operation of one, essentially, in her, uh, uh, when she worked at the House of Representatives. So now she'll have a whole team of people that she must oversee, uh, you know, and as we all know, everyone in these, uh, in this White House they are on teams, you know, and so there is always fact fighting. There is always people with knives out to try and stab you in the back. So that will be something that Stephanie's going to have to deal with in addition to just the regular churn of the craziness that is the White House, especially this White House. Do you suppose she'll have the ear of the president as we head into a presidential election and maybe give Arizona a little bit more attention than it's used to? Well, getting? I think... I, I, I think for sure because of the, the, the relationship, the long relationship. Remember, Stephanie has been on this campaign from nearly the beginning. Uh, she was doing advance all the way back in 2015, I believe. So uh, she's been with the, the Trump family for a long time when it was, remember, just a handful of people on the campaign. So she does have his ear. He has talked about how much he likes her. So I think, uh, un unlike other, like Sean Spicer and even Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Trump knows her well from a time when not many people were supportive of him. Okay, Barrett Marston joining us via Skype from Phoenix. Thank you for your analysis. Thank you, Lorraine. Appreciate it.
Over the past few weeks, we've introduced you to some of the candidates running for mayor of Tucson. Our next guest is developer Randy Dorman, who's on the primary ballot with fellow Democrats Steve Farley and Regina Romero. Unlike her competitors, this is Dorman's first run for public office. What would you say is the single biggest issue affecting Tucson? Uh, really, it is our anemic economy. And last year, we had 1.2% job growth, which is well below Phoenix, the state, the country. And uh, that's not good enough. We can be doing so much better. It's why we have 18% poverty, which is unacceptable in a city with as many resources as we have, with so many great and innovative people. And we need real leadership to change that. So that's why that's actually why I jumped in to run for mayor. I have been a businesswoman for 30 years, and I've helped lead the way in downtown revitalization for 20 years. So I really understand firsthand how to grow our economy and the different um, aspects of our economy. What are some of the ways that you would do that if elected mayor of Tucson? Well, thank you for asking that question. I have a big economic development plan. So right now we have a small economic development department, and it's largely focused on uh, incentives. What we really need is to support the small and medium-sized businesses that are here, as well as our startup community. And um, our de economic development department needs to be the resource for everything that they need to grow. We can be, connect them to job training programs. We can connect them to best practices for marketing, uh, attraction of employees, retention of employees. We can even be uh, ambassadors for them to navigate planning and development services and the sign code, all the things that make doing business in Tucson difficult right now. And then we really have to attract new businesses here. I've done business all over the world. My contacts are global, not just limited to city or state. And so I would want to be on the forefront of going out and working with companies to come here. So there's layers of things that we can do, and I want to do all of it. As we approach the fall, many Tucsonans will be looking at their ballots and trying to decipher what's the difference between you and the other candidates. What should they be asking themselves about what they want for their livelihood in the city? When we look at the problems that we have here, sometimes people say roads, not enough police, not enough parks or open space. All of those are issues, but they're really symptoms of a bigger problem, which is our lack of economic growth and economic opportunity. Um, next, I really think that uh, smart growth is what we have to focus on, because we're growing. Every time we think that if we don't plan for the growth, it won't happen, we really screw ourselves. And uh, so we need to plan for growth, and then we need to balance that with preserving neighborhoods and our character and our culture. And the final uh, thing is really sustainability. We're in the desert, and uh, our environment is so precious. Uh, so we need real tangible plans to protect our environment and um, that can really start with how we, uh, how we use our built environment for sustainability. If you're elected mayor, one of the topics that you may have to face at some point in the near future involves sanctuary cities. Yes. What are your thoughts on that issue? Uh, it's a really complex issue. There is an initiative that is trying to get on the ballot to make us officially a sanctuary city. And I've analyzed that, in, that initiative very closely. And um, there would be consequences to Tucson of um, a mil $100 million a year if we were to go that route. And many of the things that that initiative wants to do, I think could be handled in a more practical way instead of in a political way. The Tucson Police Department in 2012 created new policies in response to SB 1070 and they updated those policies in 2017. So many of the things that the initiative is looking for we already do and where we don't I think they could have had a conversation with the police department to update the policy even further. So to have a practical solution instead of this political solution which will have negative unintended consequences, even though the spirit is, is in the right place. Okay, Randy, thank you. Thank you. 
The winner of the primary in August will face independent Ed Ackerley in November, whom we'll hear from next time. We're also sharing our previous interviews with the candidates on azpm.org slash Arizona 360. The United States will celebrate 243 years of independence next week. In honor of the holiday, we're revisiting our occasional commentary series, Own Words, hearing from new citizens about what makes this country special to them. We spoke to them shortly after they took their oath of allegiance at a naturalization ceremony in Tucson. I'm so happy today. It's, it's my dream to become a American citizen. I just got the citizenship now uh, after uh, five years. Hereby declare on oath that I absolutely entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince that will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. So help me God. Congratulations, you are all now American citizens. To be a citizen to me means now I have the opportunity to vote in elections, which I think is very important. This is liberty, this is freedom, and this is a humongous responsibility. It's like a, to build a new home, a new life. I'm uh, from Iraq. Uh, I've uh, always dreamed with this day. No one protect my family and me. So I moved to USA to get this protection. This country has a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's the best, best country in the world. For all people who are becoming new citizens, I would like them to vote in elections, do whatever you have to do to make sure this country remains free, not only for citizens, but for other immigrants coming to this country. Never forget where you came from. Once you came here, they are able to learn from you too. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us. A programming note, Arizona 360 will take a break for the 4th of July holiday. We'll be back July 12th. To share your feedback, you can visit us on social media or email us at Arizona360 at azpm.org. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.